guess one of the reasons we did go about introducing our own mortgage products is because we got to a point where we had to hand off to a provider and you kind of you lose you lose a little bit of control over that process yeah. and particularly you lose transparency. Welcome to Home Screen. Um, I'm back in the hot seat after a few weeks after you've had Sunday for the past few weeks talking about design. And today we're going to be talking a little bit more about product. And I've got Jack here to talk um, about Hebito specifically, about how they're building stuff and um, all that good stuff. How are you doing today, all right? Pretty good, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you. Uh, could you give us a very quick rundown as to what Habito is? Sure. So Habito is a, an online mortgage, online mortgage broking platform. Um, we've been around for about three years, helped yeah. about 230,000 customers. And most recently, we've also become a full stack digital lender so that we can take people all the way through the process from um, exploring how much they want to borrow all the way through to um, getting their mortgage sorted and moving into their dream home or saving money on their remortgage. So in the brokerage terms, how many sort of um, products are you offering, different companies are you working with, that kind of thing? So we work uh, with uh, around 95 different lenders. Okay. Uh, so we're a whole of market lender, a whole of market broker, and we will 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 offer you recommendations whether we can place them or even if you're better going direct to the lender, we'll also tell you that as well. And now we've added our own kind of exclusive products, which is the Habito the Habito buy to let range, and you can only get those through going through our brokerage. Okay. Cool, very good. Um, and then second of all, a little question about product specifically. So you're the product director at um, Habito. Could you tell us a little bit about how product works specifically at the company? Sure, so the, uh, the product uh, is, sits within a wider, wider organization of engineering product and design. Mm -hmm. And then that is split up into a series of kind of cross-functional teams. So each of those cross-functional teams will have engineers in it, or have uh, product people, and have designers. And those broadly sit into two, uh, two divisions that we have within the organization. First of those is our brokerage uh, organization, which is all about how we can find the customer the right mortgage for them. And then there's the lending, uh, the lending division, which uh, I specifically look after from a product perspective, which is all about, okay, if they want to go down the Habito route, how can we underwrite them, uh, how can we underwrite them successfully? How can we work with our institutional partners? To make sure all of their needs are being met, and how we can bring kind of new and innovative uh, mortgages to to the market. Okay, and who, um, what kind of personnel would typically sit within a, one of your little product units that you talked of there? So it really varies uh, depending on exactly kind of what the what the needs are and what the um, what the organisation uh, demands of that particular particular thing. So each of the uh, individual units are generally to generally targeted on a particular KPI or a particular metric, and so if you're in a kind of a more upfront kind of growth type role, you'd expect to see maybe some more input from the likes of SEO specialists or uh, people who are um, looking after some of our paid acquisition channels um, and referrals. Whereas if you're looking in the, uh, the kind of the core of the underwriting system, you see more kind of back end, back end engineers or people who have experience with building out that kind of full stack uh, mortgage lending platforms. Okay, and um, design seems to be a pretty strong uh, aspect for you guys. I guess you've got a, quite a big commercial uh, operation there behind sort of getting the, the ads out and that kind of thing. Is that the sort of thing which goes on in-house or do you tend to outsource that sort of thing? So all, uh, we have a great team of uh, in-house designers uh, through UI designers, UX designers, service designers, and they work really closely with our UX research team as well mm -hmm. to make sure that anything that we, we put out there has been designed, has been tested uh, with users. All the ads that you see, we're really lucky to work with um, the, they have that kind of Santa Cruz vibe to them. We're really lucky to work with um, Jimbo Phillips Jr. who has been d designing some of the, who's famous of course for skate decks and for um, some of the uh, the great I think 60s, 60s um, stuff that he, he did. And he's come out and done some uh, great artwork for, for the ads and this kind of Rick and Morty style. Yeah, I was going to um, say it's pretty, pretty comedy mortgage. mortgage there. How did you um like why why that? How did you come across that sort of as as the the tone of voice that you wanted to go for in that regard? So the ads, the kind of the real insight we were working from here is that people um, 
find it hell to go through that go through that um, or go through that mortgage process. Yeah. And anyone who's done it before will tell you that there's stress, there, there there's all sorts of troubles, there's lots of paperwork. Um, and actually, if you come to Habito, we can simplify a lot of that for you. And we wanted to do something that was different mm. from the rest of the uh, the rest of the market. So. Um, a lot of people go for very simple kind of things around kind of home ownership and those kind of things, and we really wanted to stand out. So combining that kind of hell, uh, that hell motif with the contrast of you can go to Habito instead and everything will be simple, nice and easy, was how we came to uh, we came to that. Very okay, cool. And um, I guess the the would you describe it like in as, as provocative? Like I guess the. The question here is we've seen a few examples out there in the market of, of people going for very sort of um, very different language in that kind of regard and different imagery. Uh, I'm thinking of there's an insurance provider called Dead Happy out there, which is doing the sort of like death wish type thing. Mm -hmm. um, was that something you were conscious of when it was when it was being done? With that this is like very strikingly different and that you know some people might not get on board with that? So yeah, we definitely wanted to stand out in the market. Um, it's a very kind of fragmented market. A lot of people have kind of their guy. Yeah, um, who they go to for their mortgage broking, mm. and there those are there's a very long tail of very kind of small mortgage brokers who may be on the, uh, the corner of your local street and mm. you've been going to for a number of years. And what we wanted to do is stand out as something versus that would get people thinking: Are they still going to their guy? Are they still paying five hundred to a thousand pounds when they could actually be doing this uh, instead of nine to five at any time of the day? online and for free. Yeah, so in terms of the, um, I mentioned there of you as a brokerage, you know, you've already defined that it's now sort of split into two. Um, so interestingly, Finn on Air episode 27, this is home screen episode 27, we had your CEO Daniel Hegarty on the show and there was talk of uh, an initial tranche um, of funding coming and being used over the next two to three years. Um, so did that is the idea there for it to be used specifically for this buy to let product or are you planning to sort of like expand the range or what's the plan there? So um, we've always seen this as kind of a bit of a marketplace type platform. So there are, there are ultimately there are two there are two end customers to this. Okay. There are institutional there are institutions and um, the, our first institution is committed uh, up to 500 million pounds and specifically they want to lend in the buy to let market uh, which is great because okay. that's where we saw we, we had some gaps. Yep. But we're talking to also a number of other institutions who are interested in particular segments we've identified within residential right. that people uh, that where we people have similar kind of problems. So they may have difficulty accessing accessing finance, or they there may be things that we can see from our brokerage that people are looking for, but they're not uh, they're not being able to get those. Okay. What were the typical sort of um, sort of uh, frick, uh, frick developments that were, people were coming across, which decided, which made you decide that the buy to let was the right option for you? So when we kind of looked at when we looked at the various segments within the, within the mortgage market, what we saw specifically within buy to let was that all most existing lenders buy to let was a bit of a bolt on to their they 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 kind of built a residential mortgage platform. And then their buy to let journey was a bit of a bolt on, it was a bit of a kind of an afterthought. And a lot of the landlords that we talked to felt that they were being they were being neglected um, versus their kind of residential counterparts. Yeah. So examples of this would be uh, the average time to offer, I think, for a buy to let landlord that we saw we saw through our brokerage was 21 days. Uh, we've been able to bring that down to 10 days. Um, the, the availability of certain decisions up front yeah. um, was a real problem with them. They want to know, landlords want to know whether they can move fast, they move fast on a particular property. So if something comes up that has really great yield, there's likely to be multiple landlords who are trying to get, get that property and try and get it out onto the market quicker. Because sure. all the time that it's not, uh, not let out, you're obviously not le uh, earning any money off it. Yeah. So that's kind of where some of our instant decision, uh, our instant decision piece uh, came in. Yeah. And the combination of kind of those two things, we felt from talking to a lot of landlords, were would differentiate ourselves within this kind of buy to let space. Okay. And you talked a little bit there about the sort of the ability to um, uh, bring down that sort of waiting time. Um, was there uh, anything sort of product specific or product related which allowed you to sort of bring that down to under 10 days?
Yeah, so uh, one of the things that we do up front is that we uh, we have a complete set of rules that are programmed into the, into the system yeah. and that our individual mortgage brokers can run instantly to determine whether someone is going to be eligible for the product or not eligible for the eligible product. Okay. We kind of call that instant decision. Yeah. And where it differs from a kind of a standard lender's uh, approval in principle or mortgage in principle type process is that it actually runs all the different things that we wanted to know about the application rather than just kind of a subset of it. Okay. And it also does things like KYC checks and it does the uh, automated, runs our automated uh, valuation models as well. Okay. That means that at the point you submit the application, we're already very certain and actually all the applications that we've had, we've, the past instance decision have gone on to kind of pass the, pass the full, uh, okay. full underwriting process so far, um, is that we're pretty certain at that point that you're almost definitely going to get this, you're definitely going to get this mortgage. Yeah. Uh, and you don't need to wait for an underwriter to basically look through the case, make a bit of a decision as to, oh, does that LTV make that, meet that particular criteria? Does that combination of adverse credit or the, that combination of the customer's credit history meet it? Okay. Another way we kind of uh, worked to bring, the, bring this down was it was around our choice of kind of third parties. So we only chose the best in class third parties to work with. Um, there are valuations, all our evaluations are instructed via an API and then when the, uh, the valuer fills that in on an iPad when they're actually at the, when they're actually at the venue, takes the photos while they're, uh, while they're there, which means we get the response pretty, pretty instantly as opposed to uh, the traditional process of filling it in um, on, on paper and then they would hand it back to someone in the office and then that person would, would key it back into a system. Okay. Conveyancing as well, same thing. We, uh, we only w would work with conveyancers who would allow us to instruct via uh, an API and uh, we, had a we had a great example of a conveyancer that uh, we were working with on the brokerage site who said in their email signature that they only print off emails at 3 p.m. Write, a, write them by hand the next day and then they will send them after 3 p.m. the following day, which kind of instantly adds a whole day to the process. We've, we've built the platform and we've built the, that interaction with, uh, with conveyancers to be able to speed that up and uh, get things moving uh, as quickly as possible. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? I've, I've heard about this sort of thing before, but that must be, you know. Um, in terms of the way that that works, and you've got these conveyancing systems that, that are kind of really um, anachronistic, are they, you can't hope to have things like APIs available for these kinds of companies. So surely that limits the amount of people you can actually work with. Have you found that sort of that's affected the sort of cost, uh, the margins, or you know, is there anything like that which is affecting prices as a result of a smaller pool of, of conveyancing uh, partners? We've, uh, we've been really lucky that we found some people who are really kind of keen to work with us and they're right. keen also to kind of drive, they believe in our mission to drive, like drive down the time and drive, drive things forward. Yeah. So it's been a process of finding the right people and then making sure that we can work together in a way that works for both of us. So some of it will be that the reason why it was taking additional time was because we need, the lenders weren't providing enough information. Yeah. Uh, to the conveyancer or they weren't providing the right templates for the for the valuer. So where we found those additional examples, we've been able to actually reduce the work their side as well and automate some of their processes their side oh, okay. in order to start to speed things up without having to uh, resort to increasing costs and yeah. things like that. That's interesting. Um, one of the previous episodes that we've done of Home Screen included uh, Pension B, uh, specifically um, their product manager, Martin, and he was talking a little bit about this kind of thing of like, uh, lobbying essentially companies to improve their own processes in order to allow that sort of relationship to be more symbiotic. Um, just to move on to um, more of the market in general, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how how the feel was over at your place where where you're hearing about like Tesco losing, you know, um, offering off their, their lending books, you know, they they got rid of it in the end. Halifax, um, I guess which signifies a move towards these bigger players sort of adopting um, the lending books of, of sort of mid-tier players. How does that feel and you know, how do you respond to stuff like that? Yeah, so um, in, in, the, in the brokerage space we have seen a bit of this kind of consolidation of yeah. a few lenders. Um, Sainsbury's of course announced yesterday as well that they are gonna, they're going to be consolidating um, their books. Um, it's, 
obviously it does reduce. It's, it's very intense competition mm -hmm. in in the in the mortgage in the mortgage market at the moment, particularly in that kind of super prime prime residential space. Yeah. Um, on the back of the on the back of the ring fencing uh, legislation that, that came in. Um, what we've seen is that banks are very keen to deploy their very keen to deploy their capital into into the mortgage space. Okay. And as a result of that, the kind of the prices have come down, which is great for consumers at the end of the day. Um, but it has led to a kind of a few victims in the in the mortgage space and people starting to sell off and uh, consolidate their books. Okay. Um, we'd obviously encourage anyone who was in that, uh, who is, is part of any of those uh, any of those sales, to make sure they're still on a rate that works for them. And we're starting to see when those communications go out to customers, they come into a, they come into the brokerage and they say, "Look, I've been moved to Halifax. They've moved me to this rate." Could I be getting a better rate? Okay. And especially with the, with people moving less frequently, given the general economic uncertainty that's yeah. around at the minute, okay. that remortgage market has really kind of picked up as a result. Yeah, so it's good. Uh, could be potentially good news um, from the brokerage perspective, but from the lending perspective, is there does does that have any effect on on that side of the business that you you care about that that, that is notable? Yeah. So. Um, Obviously, it's a bit. There's there's a little bit less competition, but they're kind of the, the prices. The prices are still uh, the prices are still competitive uh, okay. in in that space. Um, we have seen actually more people entering the buy to let space specifically. I think um, this kind of buy to let being neglected um, has. Uh, has led to more people kind of starting to get in there or getting in there to offer products that are different to, to consumers. Yeah. Um, so while they're kind of maybe collapsing their, their residential books and people who are non-core, or your Sainsbury's and your Tesco, where it's not their core business, people have been moving also into the, into the buy to let space. Yeah. And particular niches of the, of the buy to let space. So we launched our company buy to let range as well um, uh, last week. Okay. So that, uh, as a result of a few tax changes that happened, uh, have, have all have been happening over the last couple of years. It's uh, for some people now more tax advantageous to um, take their kind of their buy to let out through a limited company. Okay. And for those guys, uh, there were even more limited options uh, that were out there on the market. So there's another niche where we've said, look, this is a great one for us to get involved with. Can we can we automate the process? Can we um, uh, can we integrate with the likes of the company's house mm. and additional company credit checks to, to get that uh, get that speed up as well? Okay, and that's interesting um, from a, a product perspective. So, for, did you find that your product teams have had to adapt to a certain way of operating now that you're in the lending space, or that you know you mentioned that it's your your particular focus? Is there anything? Anything about the way that you've set up the development teams or the designing, you know, any of this sort of thing, which has been interesting as a result of, of sort of moving into lending? Yeah, so it was a real, it was a real kind of interesting journey to move into lending. So we got permission to become both a lender and a broker uh, about, I think it's about eight, it was last January. Oh, so okay, so it's always been on the cards, right? It's been on the cards for quite a while. Yeah. But even before that, it took a, 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 some time to work with the FCA to say, look, you are the first people who are going to be both a broker and a lender. How are you going to make sure that that's kind of fair and transparent? So um, some of the product changes that, or some of the product enhancements that we've put in is uh, when, we, when we do recommendations, the, we issue a list of all the products that weren't recommended. We tell you why we didn't recommend them. Okay. Um, and we're kind of open and transparent uh, about that. Mm -hmm. Um, we also were kind of very conscious of that conflict of interest, so yeah. we kind of set out um, the teams that are responsible for making sure that the uh, the ranking of our product, ranking of all products uh, within our system, where we look up what would be most suitable for you, okay. and how that algorithm works, wouldn't um, particularly bias our products versus right. biasing um, uh, our. Putting our other lenders uh, out. Okay. So that is essentially a, a sort of an automated process. That's not something that you will do in any capacity as a as an organisation. You're required to be kind of algorithmically driven as to whether or not your lending will be more suitable for a user than someone else's. Yeah, um, we use a combination of both humans and algorithms to do that. Okay. 
So when you get through the the process that I think we'll we'll see, we'll see later on, yeah. you um, you get to the point where you speak to one of our mortgage experts, yeah. and they will talk to you about what your needs are. Mm. So are you is your primary driver? It needs to be the lowest cost. Are you interested in getting something that is uh, really quick uh, to be getting to offer? Yep. Are there other factors that, that might be playing in? Have you got some poor credit history? So you really want a certain decision uh, right now. Um, so they will put those. They will talk to you about those factors, and they will put those factors into into our system, and then that will generate a ranking. Yeah, and we will show that full ranking to the customer, who will at that point say, "Okay, I can see that there are." Five or six. You've given me um, one recommendation, but you've 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 said these five are probably not suitable. Yeah. And then they can have a that back and forth with the um, with the experts. Say, okay, what would happen if I extended the term, or what would happen if actually how much more expensive would it be if we went for something that would save me five days versus the offer? So, it was about giving those guys the tools mm -hmm. to be able to present in a kind of fair and transparent way the the different lending options that they could do based on the customer's uh, customers needs now that you are doing this sort of lending and these are inherently your own products is there anything involved from a product perspective um, that you know in terms of how you're doing mortgage repayments if you wanted to overpay or something like that um, the way that you're communicating with people now that it's your own mortgage rather than handing off to a different provider um, is there anything that you've had to introduce there as a result yeah, so one of the, I guess one of the reasons we did go about introducing the uh, introducing our own mortgage products is because we got to a point where we had to hand off to a provider, and you kind of you lose you lose a little bit of control over that process, yeah. and particularly you lose transparency over what's what's been happening there. Okay. So at the point you submit to a submit to a lender, most lenders will have some kind of very basic online uh, online tracking system. And then they rely on one of our members of our team ringing every single day uh, for every customer and asking, and then providing a providing an update uh, for that. Okay. Where we are also the lender, we can then obviously provide much more direct updates uh, to the customer, so they know exactly at every step of the way where their application is, what's okay. happening, what what the requirements we we have of them. And what format will that typically take? Will it be like email comms or? Like that. Yeah, so we use a combination of email comms and also our instant the instant chat system. Yeah, okay. So they can they can log on and ask questions, um, or they will receive kind of outbound emails on, on on the back of what they're doing. Okay. And then when it goes into servicing, we've uh, we've we've partnered with a great servicing partner um, who uh, provides all of the kind of the repayment uh, all the repayment mechanisms and uh, provides the ability for. Uh, a customer to overpay or change their repayment day, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and we were really kind of super careful when we were when we were picking those guys to make sure that they could do both what we want to do now in terms of transparency and being able to do some of these uh, these processes online, okay. but also as we evolve the product and we're going to have as we move into uh, more of the residential space and we have more unique features. They're all, they will be also be, hopefully be able to cope with some of those unique features and, and move some of those forward. Okay. And in terms of these service partners, is this the sort of thing where you've got to keep the relationship private in terms of um, in terms of naming them or telling them, or is this something you talk about publicly? Um, so the servicing partner, I think we've we've talked about publicly. Um, it's it's Pepper. Um, um, Pepper Money, who uh, who look after our servicing. Okay. Um, we work with. Kind of Equifax from a from a uh, credit credit bureau perspective, and then we have partners from um, a conveyancing conveyancing fraud um, KYC. We work with like on on Fido, okay, and so there's some big names in there. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. Are you finding these people are happy to be sort of affiliated and have these relationships? Do they do they like being sort of named publicly in that regard? Yeah, I think the um, being. Being associated with uh, or seeing their products kind of used to the to the full capacity, yeah. um, in the as as they are in, in this this uh, this example, is probably a probably a good thing. Um, we've we've had a, a really good working relationship with all of our kind of all of our third parties. But I wanted to ask a little bit about the way that you're delivering and sort of how you're getting your products out there. Um, how do you do continuous delivery and keep these things moving along? So the, the first kind of core thing for me is that each of those teams have their own core KPI, right. and that everyone within the team. So if it's uh, if it's 
if it's an engineering, a product, a design team, everyone within the team understands the, that KPI and understands the drivers that, that, that sit with it, within yeah. it. Um, they are autonomous to the point where they can decide what they want to do in order to, to meet that uh, to meet that KPI. Mm -hmm. And we've had some great ideas come from kind of across the uh, across the engineering product and design organisation. And um, the only thing we kind of ask is that everything you do can be measured and can be measured against that okay that um, that key result that we've okay. set uh, out for them. Um, we've also spent a long time investing in our in our tooling, mm -hmm. so. Uh, we have a dedicated, uh, we have one of those engineering product design or, um, autonomous teams are responsible for specifically building tools for our internal developers. So they have a key result around uh, speed, to, speed to get things out and speed to, for, for building, building and deploying the system. So okay. those guys will help in providing the tooling that means that the individual product teams can both be autonomous and they can go fast. Okay, and you, I would imagine you've been using OKRs then based on how you've been talking. Um, how have you found that as like a methodology for sort of um, keeping things moving along? Yeah, it's been really good. I think what, what it's really done for us is that it's forced, it forces you to think about what's really important. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to kind of sit down and write a list of like 20 or 30 things that as an organisation you think will be important over the next quarter or over the next kind of six months. Yeah. But distilling that down to like three or five things that are the core things and the core things that you want to shift mm -hmm. really helps to put a focus within the organization and it gives people something to be aiming for. So that has meant that when you come to make a tough product decision or a tough engineering decision, you can look to those OKRs and say, is it gonna move it? If it's not gonna move it, why are we doing it? Yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah, we're just in the process now of doing our own sort of like reviews, so it's uh, always interesting to see how other people are doing it. Um, a final question on the more general process, and this relates to uh, open banking. So, like, the, we've got big legislation out there in the minute uh, related to sort of open banking, um, the Competition and Markets Authority Nine, which relates more to retail and consumer banking. Um, is there any influence there from on your perspective? Do they have an influence, and in what in what ways? Yeah, so there's a couple of opportunities that we kind of see in this space. Um, the movement, we have to do of income verification and we have to do bank account verification. We also have to do kind of affordability calculations when someone comes to us to apply for a mortgage. And currently this may comprise of either complicated form filling or use of, use of statistics or um, as some lenders do, kind of getting a bank statement and trying to work out like roughly how much did you spend on haircuts in mm -hmm. the last kind of uh, in the last twelve months? Yeah, the opportunity there for open banking is to be able to take away that manual process and take away that form filling for yeah. for individual individual customers. So it's just another way for us to be able to simplify and automate some of the processes that will will come in. We also see the legislation go through around it kind of landing within mortgages as well. That's, yeah. That is super exciting mm. um, from a brokerage perspective because then we can more closely monitor your mortgage and your overpayments that may be happening and make sure that you're kind of on the right deal at the right time. Um, there's a little bit of a black box uh, in terms of what the, what the only what you only know what the customer tells you in terms of the, what their ongoing mortgage is if it's with a, if it's with another provider today yeah. if that kind of thing was available by open banking the services to make sure that you are always paying the right amount and you couldn't be uh, you couldn't be on a better deal will hopefully take off as a result so that's your pledge your <laughs> request of the competition and markets authorities to give us that kind of thing um, awesome so we're going to take a quick look now at the initial sort of application process on the mobile here um, so we're going to start off, as we said, we're both going to talk through this um, and sort of describe a little bit of what's going on. Um, but essentially this is the initial process mm -hmm. that we usually will go through. They'll sort of enter in email details, that kind of thing. And we'll be able to sort of, um, sort of move through and provide all the relevant details that you will, um, as, far as, as far as we mentioned there, uh, need to make the decision a bit quicker. Um, got a magic link going there, so um, that allows you to, I guess, very quickly validate an email address, right? Yeah, uh, and customers, uh, customers, particularly customers on mobile, said that 
another password is probably not not necessarily what they want. So yeah. that being able to click directly into their email and then back and forth was 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 a really quick way of them getting to log in. Very cool. And then we've got these sort of very clear sort of um, radio buttons type things where we can move through. And then you're revealing more information the further on down this form you go. I guess that's to make things a little bit more manageable and bite sized right? Yeah, and it also helps us to personalize the journey. So if you're, a, if you're a home buyer, you're probably just coming here to find out like how much you can borrow, or if you're a bit further down the process, whether you could take a particular house. Whereas yeah. if you're a remortgager, you're probably interested in how much can I save by remortgaging, or can I raise more capital by remortgaging? So it helps us to personalize those next questions that, that come up for you. Very cool, and um, as we, um, uh, and as we can see here, this is sort of form-based. We've seen previous examples of stuff from, from you guys where you've been able to gather this information via a chat interface. Um, and I we'll guess we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but this form exercise will be continuous throughout the process until we get to a handoff point. Um, but so far, we've got sort of key bits of information here, like your name and that kind of thing. Um, and then a mobile number got this sort of like nice ring around the outside of the tech box to let tech box to let you know where you want to be quite you know nice uh, clean interface here and then we're adding address details that kind of thing so and we chose to use a kind of there was a, a modal for some of these things like that so we've got some we've got some things that are repeated repeated yeah. information so things like you may be having your deposits from multiple sources you may be having multiple addresses and we chose to use a modal there to kind of keep it compact and so you can keep a, like a view over what it is that uh, you've added without having the whole details exploded and it taking up a lot of space, especially on mobile. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I guess in terms of conserving space, this is more of a thing for mobile, um, but we do have the option to see this on sort of desktop as well. We can do this sort of thing. Um, a little, a little word on sort of the mobile experience in itself. Have you found that sort of a, a design problem or a design tr um, challenge? Yeah. So um, when, whenever we design, we kind of design for a whole range of different different screen sizes. Everything yeah. from uh, we don't kind of see it anymore. As there's mo there's a mobile and there's a desktop. There's a tablet. There's a super wide screen. Yeah. There's kind of all it has to work for every single screen size from the from the smallest uh, the, the smallest and thinnest phones all the way up to, to the widest ones yeah and there's what we've done is broke it down into particular elements so we know that okay if you have a kind of a radio button this works for this, this size it'll work for this size but you would then change the stacking of them or you change the change the, the formatting of them right and we've tested a lot of these different kind of combinations uh, okay. with users so when we get users in to do user testing, we're not just getting them to sit down in front of a desktop, which is our standard size and our standard one that we have in the computer uh, that we have in the in the office. We're also getting them to use different screen sizes, or as much as we can, actually getting them to use their own devices because yeah. that's what they're used to, and that's kind of where you get the most uh, genuine feedback. As that's really interesting. And um, finally, we've got this, as we mentioned earlier, handoff to one of the. Um, one of the mortgage experts we've got, and this will typically happen via this this uh, call to action button or this um, sort of intercom sort of uh, chat interface. Cool. So that was um, a little short overview of the sort of form um, that the users will go through for an initial process. Um, so can you? Uh, we've just touched there on the information architecture specifically. So, um, but in terms of what stuff's required, we've got a lot of uh, a lot of info there, and um, we've gathered. So they were you were asking very specific questions. Um, so how do you kind of go about ordering and sort of ranking those in terms of where they want to be in the hierarchy? So the more questions we, are, we could ask, the more specific we can provide you with a mortgage recommendation. Yeah. But obviously the more questions you ask, the longer it takes for a user and the feedback we get is don't ask me hard questions, so questions that you don't almost immediately know. So we don't want to ask for your national insurance number because that would probably involve someone going to go and have, have to look it up somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so that we kind of we've been working super hard to reduce that number of questions, but try and keep as much of the accuracy of the re the recommendation that comes off the back uh, as a result. Okay. 
Some of that will result in the, so, that, so what you saw, the unfolding of the questions. If you ask, answer yes to particular things, it means that we may need to ask for additional information okay. because you have a particularly difficult type of flat. Or that changes the decision tree then, I guess, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you might, if you have a thatched roof, we probably then need to know what fire protection you have on the back of it. But I'm not going to ask you about your fire protection if you've been living in a, if you live in a house with a, with a, with a, um, a normal kind of tiled roof. Yeah. We also try and ease people through that process. So we start with kind of very simple questions about their transaction, exactly what it is they're trying to do, some things about their name, things that they know before we get into um, into more complex, uh, more complex things, and give them the option in in certain circumstances to also to say, I don't actually have this piece of information yet. Okay. So okay, cool. A great example of that is when we get to finding out about the property they are potentially looking to buy. Some users don't have a property yet, so the first thing we ask is, do you have a property? If you don't have a property, we can still help you uh, find out how much you can borrow, and then you can come back and add the property later. Okay, and um, all of this was delivered, as we touched on there, uh, via a sort of a form-based system. And one of the big questions that we had from a lot of the product guys in, in 11FS was, they wanted to know um, about, because we've known you to have chat interfaces, that kind of thing, have used that sort of thing previously. And there was this big internal debate as to like w what constitutes best practice and that kind of thing. Some guys were like, form, 97% of the best companies all use forms and yada, yada, yada. And then some people like, well, we've just implemented a chatbot in my last place and it's, really, uh, and it's really helped us to be able to speak to them in a more sort of useful fashion. Um, what's the approach now? And kind of um, what led you towards this? So we did, we do, and we still do have a chat interface for certain uh, certain customer segments. So that was the kind of one of the pieces of insight that yeah. we, we took away was that some customers, particularly um, uh, people who are kind of more serious uh, mm -hmm. about what they're doing, didn't find the chat interface that great, or that they're more kind of pro users. Doesn't a chat interface doesn't allow them to kind of get through those questions super yeah. quickly? So we've taken it out for some of those. Okay. We also were, we've also tested it with different types of questions. So we found that particularly where there are binary options, uh, that's when your chat interface works better mm -hmm. than if you have a kind of a free, a free text entry. It's much harder to prov provide kind of uh, validation on, where you can provide validation on a form to say, oh, this doesn't look like an email address or you know, this isn't long enough, okay. th those kind of things. You can't provide that in a, in a chat interface in a, in a way that looks to still be a chat interface and that doesn't result in you having to kind of retype or you having to kind of go back and forth with the uh, individual chats. Okay. However, we did find that some people found it useful for particular things. So uh, on some of our residential journeys, we still have it for giving some kinds of, uh, so it gives the, it's, the first piece of advice, and then there's kind of a bit of a warm handover from the automated, uh, the automated part of advice onto our kind of mortgage expert advice. Okay, and um, are there any particular instances of products within your sort of, um, uh, like for example, with your lending? Did you did you find the did you find the need to use it for that, or sort of we removed it from there? Um, so we we don't have it for our lending uh, for our lending products today. Because for the reasons you outlined, yeah, yeah, for some of the kind of, kind of similar reasons. Okay, um, but there may be things in future where we would want to explore it, perhaps for service, particular service inquiries, yep. or for routing some of those kind of things. Okay, um, but that that's 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 kind of up for up for debate and up for kind of working out what the best the best approach for those things are. Yeah. Okay. And so, like in terms of your co cohort analysis um, it, that that's been done, you know. Where what sort of users would you typically find would be enjoying this like this this interface? Is there a certain type of user who would enjoy that? So we found that the kind of the less perhaps some of the less experienced users when they came okay. in and they went through our um, if you're kind of new to mortgages yeah, yeah. and you're not just trying to power through the form in order to, yeah. to, to get something. It's that, better than being on the phone, right? I guess, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, and it's good for presenting if you want to present quite a lot of information and then say yes or no yep. uh, for, the, for those kind of questions. They found that, found that useful. Uh -huh. But for a more kind of pro user who just wants to, this is my 10th remortgage, yeah. this, is, this is my eighth buy to let. Um, yeah. I, know exactly what's, I know exactly what's going on. I know exactly what these main. questions are. I don't need the tool tips. I don't need the uh, okay. uh, additional help that you're going to provide. 
just 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 get me a, just get me a mortgage. That's interesting. So there's like I guess a cognitive load element for those which don't have a, a high cognitive load from something like this. Then it's a lot easier to just do the form, and then with your less experienced first time users, then presenting it in bite sized chunks or Actually, I think one of the interesting things is I think I've seen a, a journey of yours which included um, a chat interface, a form, and then a handoff to an intercom support, like one of your mortgage broker um, support staff. Um, that must be um, a way of diversifying the, the sort of like, doesn't make it overwhelming if you've got three different modes of delivering that information. Would that make sense? Yeah, um, it also it allows people to get some value back, even when we're some people do want to take try and uh, take a mortgage at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and our um, our mortgage experts are not available at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and it allows us to provide some kind of advice and some kind of value for those before it gets picked up with the um, by the one of the mortgage experts in the following morning. Okay. And um, so on the sort of mortgage experts, there is a little, um, uh, that sort of would round off the process of this, of this particular step, right? You would be sort of filling out your details and then your mortgage experts would go through the, the criteria of what you've entered. What's the step for them like? What would they then do? So they will then uh, pull up one of our internal tools. Okay. And our, one of our internal tools that we have there allows them to take the details that you provided and will pro and, uh, come up with a list of potential mortgages that we know, based on the information that you provided, would be potentially suitable for you. Okay. And then they can have a conversation that says, look, this is, one of the, this is one or this is two mortgages that I think would be really good for you. Which one of these two do you want? Yeah. Here's the ones that were less suitable. Here is why they were less suitable. And they can answer kind of any specific questions that the individual customer might have about those uh, particular mortgages. Yeah, and that's still a valued process by the user rather than automating it, right? Absolutely. I okay. the that one of the highlights that, that our customers say um, is that when they come to actually talk to a talk to a user, is one of the highlights of the process. Um, they find that it doesn't necessarily have value for things like basic data collection. You don't need to be on the phone or you don't need to be chatting to someone to, to collect you know, my name, whatever. Yeah. But when it comes to saying, oh, I've got this thing, but I also want to tell you a little bit about my story and about why I want this, why I want this particular mortgage, at that point, they do want to be talking to a human and they do want to have that kind of human interaction as an addition to the, to the algorithm and what it is, just not yeah. just a ranking of, of products. That's fascinating. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, so just to, to just to round off here, I wanted to kind of ask you a few questions about the future for you guys in terms of um, what's going on at the moment and what you're looking forward to sort of in the products life cycles in the next few sort of months or so. I guess you can't really go further than that, can you? Yeah. So um, our, we're continuing with our with our, in our lending side. So we're continuing to expand into additional segments. Yeah. So we've already committed that we'll also uh, start allowing portfolio landlords. Um, at some point in the future, that was another pain point that we identified with customers okay. was if I have 20 properties, I don't want, I, I have to key in details of 20 properties or fill in a form and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we believe that we can really simplify the process for portfolio landlords. Okay. And then we're also working with ins other institutions to potentially to bring residential products to the market. So there's a couple of segments there that we want to address okay. and partner banks so that we can offer our so this of, is further lending, right? Exactly. So yeah. we can offer our underwriting and our, 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 our process to speed up some of those more old-fashioned uh, processes they might have. Excellent. Okay. Uh, well, that rounds up today's show. Um, I, thank you very much, Jack, for coming on the show. Um, if you want to see a little bit more of Home Screen and uh, especially 11FS Pulse, the product which underlines what we're doing here, then head over to pulse.11fs.com. Uh, you can sort of request a demo there and see what's going on and then also take a look at some of the other great stuff we've got going on. Um, if you've got any questions about um, any products or if you want to know um, about more stuff that we can offer here on, on home screen, um, then make sure that you either email us at pulse at 11fs.com or find us on Twitter at 11fs pulse. Uh, Jack, where can anyone find out about you? Yeah, so um, if, you, if you're interested in a mortgage or you're interested in our lending products, uh, go to habito.com uh, where you can uh, you can go through the process that we've just seen now, or you can uh, chat to uh, chat to one of our one of our experts to find out more. Cool. Uh, thanks very much for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. 
Home Screen is a show about all things product and design, where we showcase some of the best examples of user experiences from the 11FS Pulse research platform, which includes over 2,500 user journeys from financial service products around the world. 